Okay, we're going to get into the MAR, residential contract of sale. So the differences in this one, remember, Virginia is the land of large documents, and Maryland is the land of large documents and addenda. So there's a lot of addenda in, uh, in Maryland, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. All right, time is of the essence. Don't drag your feet. Seller, buyer, property, estate. Uh, it's being conveyed in in in, uh, in fee simple. These blanks are actually put a check mark there. That's what goes here. Um, it's not looking for something to be filled in there. It's like, okay, what is it? Check mark fee simple or check mark subject to an annual ground rent in the amount of X number of dollars payable semi annually as now or recorded among the land records of put the city and the county. Okay. Purchase price. Um, how much payment terms. This is where uh, usually you're just saying um, the buyer has delivered or will deliver X number of days for the contract, a deposit. That's an earnest money deposit. An additional deposit, usually that's just left blank. Most people are just putting the one deposit in and they'll be held by whom? Okay. Um, and if it's the brokerage, which if you're writing in the brokerage, you know, brand X says, hey, just do it to us, then you don't need that escrow agreement I was showing you. The escrow agreement is when there's a title company. This one is if it's going to the real estate brokerage. Most of them go to, uh, um, they go to a title uh, company. Okay. How will it be held in an interest bearing or non interest bearing account? Deposit. Um, again, it reviews everything that was in what we just went through. Okay. When's the settlement date? And it's very important that you check all these addenda that are enclosed, okay? Um, this is a really minutia thing I'm about to say on the addenda and disclosures. If you're ever doing a uh, assumption, and I would also say if you're doing a short sale, um, when you send this file to the short sale bank or send this file to the assumption bank, that's going to deal with it. Break these files up into individual files when you're sending it to them. Um, those, the short sale folks and the assumption bank folks do not know what the buyer request for seller's compensation or buyer's broker form is. They don't know what the additional as is for. They're just looking at the form. And I was in a, um, uh, we were doing a, an assumption with a VA loan. And they kept coming back to me. I don't see this form. And everything they were asking for was in my big file I sent to them. And it hit me. They don't know what to look for. They're flipping through the file. They don't see it. So they're asking me to send it again. So when you're dealing with a disclosure or a short sale or even a bank sale, don't put all these forms in one. Because we like to put it all in one big file and send it to the buyer, and the buyer agent and seller agent. Um, so just that's just a little sidebar on if you've got these, divide them all out. Um, but be sure that you have all these checked off what's supposed to be there. Okay. 12 is the, you know, electronic signature agreement. This is the entire agreement. Um, this one came up. I just did my little quick video yesterday on what happens if you're, someone dies or becomes incapacitated. And this is what's in the contract is that if someone passes away or someone becomes incapacitated, um, the heirs, executors, administrators, personal representatives, successors, uh, and if permitted, provided the signs, they carry out the rest of it. Uh, what I said in that video also was the thing that would stop this is if the person involved in the sale, the buyer, if no one can qualify to purchase it without the income from that person or their proceeds. Um, if it's the heirs, you know, you know, dad dies, mom dies, or grandpa dies, grandma dies, and all their money was being used to do it, the heirs, if that money is still there, may have to still go to closing. You can still try to get out of this because of the death of a, a party, and if everyone is okay with that, you can still terminate the agreement. 
but the contract provides for the next in line will carry this through. So um, that's what's already in the contract. Computation of days, um, different in Maryland. The day will be measured from midnight to 1159, 59 p.m. That's a day. So stuff has to be turned in by midnight. In a, well, no, by 11.59. <laughs> Not midnight, by 11.59. Yeah, they've added that in this one. I was just talking with NVAR. It's a whole different topic, but you guys are know I'll do that. Um, in Maryland, in, in Northern Virginia, there's this thing about, well, you have till midnight for HOA documents. And I went to the code yesterday, couldn't find it, sent it over to NVAR, said, look, I know you're saying... 11.59, but it's not in the code. And they got back to me and said, huh, you're right. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll do a little video on that and how you comp compute days on HOA documents because the code does not, um, it doesn't say that in the code, but it's the accepted practice. But in computation of days, we've got um, days means consecutive calendar days, including Saturday, Sunday, and holidays, whether federal, state, local, or religious. Day is measured from midnight to 11.59 p.m. Um, the next night. For the purposes of calculating days, the count of days shall begin on the day following the day. So you ratify today, day one is tomorrow. So this is where, this is where it can kind of nail you if you get everything done at 9 p.m., because you really don't get a full three, you get three hours before the next day kicks in. Uh, but anyway, just be aware of that. Seller agrees to keep existing mortgages free of default. I had a deal that did that and he went three months without paying or two months. So that was not fun. Um, and we wound up having to rearrange things at closing to make it to closing because now he owed more than what his payment was. Um, and this is all the responsibility of the seller. So where 15 comes into play, and it's very important for you to understand, is when you have a post-settlement occupancy and a pre-settlement occupancy. The seller has responsibility, even in a pre-settlement occupancy, to keep things going, all right? Um, just keep that in mind. And the property is to be held at risk of seller until legal title has passed. Keep the insurance in place. I think I mentioned this before. If they're if it's absentee, they need a different kind of policy than what they would if they were living in it. Leases, uh, seller can't like if they're doing a uh, an investment property and the lease is over in sixty days, and then the tenant comes up in the middle of this contract and says, "Hey, I want to extend this for six months." The seller doesn't have a right to extend that. So they can't they can't negotiate new leases or renew existing ones during the uh, um, yeah beyond settlement or possession date without buyer's written consent. Buyer may not want it as a, they're, they're buying it maybe subject to a lease, but they want to they want to um, they want to move into it. Okay, so don't don't cause a problem with your seller. This contract is non-assignable unless you cross this line out. Um, okay, they even got a paragraph section paragraph headings. They're for convenience and reference only. Okay, you got to know they put this in there because somebody argued about it. Anyway, section two, payment of the purchase price, financing. Please fill this out. Um, get on the phone with the lender. And before you do closing, before you get a contract, you should have had a discussion with the lender on what is this buyer doing? I see this empty on a lot of contracts. Um, yeah, believe it or not. Or they'll do conventional or whatever. They'll check one of these boxes, but they won't fill out the financing commitment information. Okay. Uh, they agree to make a written application. Having reviewed the other stuff in the listing agreement and where the buyer can get out, you can see why this is important to have a certain number of days on here. If they can get out within five days of filing an application, you just gave them more time. So you want this a little bit tighter here. Hopefully they've already applied. 
Um, they may have made an application, but the lender may not have nailed it down because they need a ratified contract to get things going. All right. Buyer responsibility in Maryland. This They make application, but then paragraph says, get off the fence, make this start happening, do it quickly and in good faith. So a buyer can't drag their feet to get all of this application completed and then claim, well, I didn't get qualified. Well, that works if you got everything in and then the buyer um, is disqualified because they got everything in. If they get disqualified because they didn't get all the materials in, um, didn't verify everything for the lender on time, then it's disingenuous to say I got, I got turned down uh, because of no fault of my own. Um, paragraph says, you know, we're just saying there is no lease of or or sale of another property unless it's written out and we have a whole nother addendum that does deal with that. Um, alternative financing provider, uh, provided buyer timely and diligently pursues the financing described um, in, par in above paragraph, the buyer may also apply for alternate financing. If they obtain a written commitment for financing in which the loan amount, term, et cetera, differ from the financing described in this one or any addendum called the financing application or any addendum shall be deemed to have been fully satisfied. So they can get it. And it just says, you, we, we can't preclude you from doing it, um, but it can't increase the cost of the seller or exceed the time allowed to secure the finance. Section three, property condition. Inclusions, exclusions, we've got the forms for that. Um, and some, some buyers are like, what do you mean it's sold as is? I didn't, well, it is. The contract says as is, unless you have other forms in play, which would be the home inspection. And in Maryland, they got five days prior to settlement to uh, confirm the condition. And if you have an inspection contingency, you click here on paragraph 26. Can't leave this blank. Is the buyer going to have it or not have it? Okay, HOA, notice regarding disclosure. And we talked about the disclosure water deferment. And we talked about the um, private domestic water supply. Um, this is a disclosure in paragraph 30. The seller should know this. Uh, the agricultural use assessment is reduced property tax assessment. Bold headlines. If the property is assessed in the agricultural use category and the buyer does not intend to use, the tax may become due and should be and could be substantial. It could be a few thousand dollars. And so um, who's going to pay that? You've got to negotiate this. Notice concerning conservation easements, forest conservation, forest conservation act notice, most property in a subdivision are not gonna come under 31 to uh, 33. Okay, again, the disclosure and disclaimer statement, ground rent, if you're like a mobile home or something, all these items on lead-based paint, we kind of went through that with the listing agreement. Um, if they renovate and repair the people doing that in a house pre-78, the contractors have to be certified by the EPA. Just a notice to them before that. Then there's the Maryland Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. So they have their own forms as well. And make sure those are attached when you're doing a, a buyer side of the deal. Okay. Property insurance brochure. Um, it actually has it here. Property insurance basics. You want to make sure the buyer has received a copy of this. Flood insurance notice. Again, you've got links here that you want the buyer to click through and understand. Oh, this is good. Hmm.
Lots of notices in here about the Chesapeake and Atlantic Coastal Bay's critical area. This is an advisement to them. Um, these are things on these notices, you don't want to be crossing them out, okay? Um, they're just notices. They got to know about it. The criminal activity and sexual offenders um, list. And that's at the Maryland. Uh, Virginia has this as a, uh, a link. So they would need to go search this in the Maryland Department of Public Safety. Military installation uh, installations. And it shows you where it's not, uh, uh, where it does not affect these counties here. Obviously, it affects ours. Um, and then this is the whole thing about no representations. Brokers, their agents, sub-agents, employees make no representations with respect to all the items in here, the lot size, the exact location. You do want to be um, aware and be pointing things out to your buyer, but this is a protection uh, notice here that, look, if it says quarter acre and it comes back that it's like less than a quarter, it's not 0.25, it's 0.20. I can't be held accountable for that. That's up to the buyer to uh, to measure that out. Um, again, I'm advising you on the real estate transaction. I'm not advising you on the items in this paragraph, paragraph B. Um, buyer and seller on the dime for paying vendors. Uh, this is something that sometimes agents will take on the cost of paying for something and say, I'll get pack, paid back at closing. Be careful in doing that. I mean, you know, a couple of hundred dollars is one thing, a couple of thousand, you're assuming that they're gonna pay you back at closing. And right now, one out of five deals fall apart. So be careful that you're paying things up front for your clients, okay? Protection of Homeowner Foreclosure Act notice. Not a lot of those going around, but they need to be aware of this if you are involved in a home, in a um, foreclosure. Homestead tax credit notice to buyer. If you plan to live in this home as your principal residence, you may qualify for the homestead. Again, another link there for them to take a look at. If any real property is transferred after January 1 and before the beginning of the tech, next taxable year, a new owner, may, new owner may submit a written appeal as to the value or classification on or before 60 days. So they can try to get the tax bill down. Pretty much that's what that's for. The buyer has the right to select the settlement service provider. This is a national thing. So when sellers want to do their own thing, that's fine. But the seller um, cannot require them to use someone. You see that in contracts. Seller prefers. That one always kills me. Um Oh, yeah, the seller, they they prefer this settlement company. It's really the listing company. Deed and title. Um, this is just letting them know, and this is kind of like the buyer is relying on the title company to show them any problems with title. Um, if there is a problem with title, um, then there's the, the seller has uh, 14 days to fix it. Um, if they can't fix it, the seller can have an option of taking such title as incurred not to exceed half of 1% of the purchase price. Um, and if they can't, if, if title can't be cleared up, let's just put it this way. Paragraph 49 gives the buyer the ability to, um, to, get out of the contract. This could be places like um, an easement on the property. Can't clear that up. Um, there's a note on the property from a previous owner and they can't clear that up. Things like that. And if the seller can't clear it out, it gives an option to the buyer to move out. Or to, to, Can you to still the, get an insurance on the adjustments property? is just letting the buyer know, look, everything you're seeing right now is today's um, um, cost and that they will probably adjust in the future. Um, and then the settlement cost, explain to the buyer that they'll pay their own settlement costs and the seller will pay their settlement costs. 52, transfer charges. Okay. Um, this is where... Is Customarily, be... this is split 50-50, okay? 
if buyer is not a first time Maryland home buyer, payment of recordation taxes and state and local transfer taxes will be divided equally between buyer and seller unless otherwise stated here. You can try to get the seller to pay more. I did that in my last contract and the seller wasn't happy. <laughs> so, it's always this way. Well, no, that's not what the contract says. My seller would like to have more. Now, this will be folded in, at least with the lender I was using. This is included in the cost that would be um, a limited, it could be limited by how much the buyer is allowed to get in closing cost assistance. So let's say you're getting 3% closing cost assistance and now you're trying to get more, but this puts them over to the 3%. You can't be creative and give that. The seller, there's a limit on what the seller can help the buyer do to purchase the property. Okay, I'm getting that alien look on my video again here. Anyway, uh, with the first time Maryland home buyer, Maryland law provides that the amount of state transfer tax due on the sale to a first time buyer is reduced. So it's reduced by half and shall be paid entirely by the seller. It really means the seller is going to pay the same amount because they've reduced it by half. Okay. Unless otherwise stated here. So in the bottom of this contract, it says, are you a first time Maryland home buyer? Make sure that this is clear to the buyer of what their costs are going to be. You want the lender to put this together and give it to the buyer and make sure that the buyer is looking at the lender's paperwork. This is an overall statement I'm making, not just about transfer taxes. Uh, I've had buyers that they have their own sheet that they're putting together and then they're getting these numbers from the lender and they're letting their sheet trump over what the lender sent them. Don't let them do that. They'll be very surprised at the tail end of the contract if they're trying to do their own calculations. Again, this is what we talked about in the listing paperwork, the non-resident seller. I'm not going to go deeper into that, but here are the links for people to go to to make sure they get this cleaned up. The foreign investment FERPTA, we talked about that. Okay, the FERPTA broker's fee. All parties irrevocably instruct the settlement officer to collect the fee on compensation and distribute it. Okay. Broker liability. Um, look, we're just involved in the transaction, but we're not responsible for things that we can't be responsible for. Property owner's title insurance. It's up to them. I know there's some people say, you know, these can get really expensive. Why should I do it? That's a lot of money for a, a policy. I would submit, when does it matter? It matters when it matters. And also they're paying for that title insurance way up front. So it's good for the life of the time that they're in the property. So it's not like if you if you weighed out what your cost would be for your buyers and your, your car insurance and you were paying, you know, 20 years in advance, that'd be thousands of dollars too, but you're not. So at the, t at the closing table, they're just making sure that this is paid for up front. And it just takes care in case something comes up on their property that has to be paid out. Anthony. I think there's not Anthony. a whole lot different here than what's in Virginia on default. Can, uh, mediation. We'd rather go with mediation me? rather than going into a lawsuit. Can you hear me? This could Anthony. be mediated through uh, the local association. Uh, it could be mediated through professional mediators. Um but each state has their own rules for mediation rules and guidelines. Okay. Anthony? Loser pays the winner's attorney's fees. Hello. Everyone signs here. Hello? Anthony. Check here for first time Maryland home buyer, your information. Okay. You guys were quite quiet on this. So any, any questions on the contract? Hello, Anthony. Hello. Okay. All right. Can you yes. hear me? Raven. Can you hear me? I, I, I Are can't. you talking? Can you hear me? You're talking. I can't hear you. I don't know. I. All right. Hold on a second. It may be on my end. Give me, give me a second here. Can you hear now? I can hear you. I don't know. Okay. If you now can I can hear you. Me. All right. Great. What's your question? Yeah. Yeah. The question is if the, uh, that, you know, the buyer decide to buy the property with a cloud on the title. Will it still be will he still be able to uh, 
uh, get insurance or title insurance. Hold on, can you can you start over? The uh, the television jumped in and I couldn't hear your question. What yeah. was I, I said, you know, if if the buyer buys a property where, where you still have a cloud on the title, he you know he he just decide to move forward with that. Will it still be? Will he still be able to uh, get insurance or title insurance? Title insurance, I don't think so. Which is interesting on this one in Maryland. Um, this is why in Maryland they have the seller has fourteen days. Um to clean it up. And if they can't, then um, they can not make it null and void. The Virginia paragraph used to have, you've got 10 more days to fix it. And they took that out. But the problem you just mentioned is exactly correct. If the lender can't put title insurance on that for their title, then they will, they will most likely reject the loan. So then it becomes a financing issue. Um, in a cash deal, they probably wouldn't care. One of the deals I had is the items we were picking up that were a problem for the buyer, it was a flip. And the problems we were picking up on, on the flip, was not a concern for the investor because he bought it with cash and didn't know these items were there. Um, in particular, I have one in a floodplain. He didn't know that. He didn't care. He just bought the house fix it up a little bit and was selling it again. And because he didn't have a loan, these items didn't come up in the title because the, there was no, the, there was a title check for the, the title company, but there was not a title check for the lender. And so there was no lender saying you can't buy this because of the flood. He said he didn't know it was in the floodplain, but then suddenly he did know the neighbor had flood insurance. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, people. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. The neighbor's got blood insurance. So that, that's a good point. Yeah. Because they're all intermingled. It might not say you can get out, but if you can't, if this affects something else, that's my, what, that might be what terminates the contract. Exactly. Okay. All right. So I think we already went through the buyer request for seller's compensation. So we'll kind of bypass that. Um, now this form, the buyer request for seller's compensation, buyer's broker addendum is separate from the seller contribution addendum. If the seller is being asked to give the buyer closing cost assistance, they need to use the seller contribution addendum. And I'm going to, 